I am going to get us started with presentations and we're going to get kicked off by Annika Mines of Twisp River Seed. So Annika, take it away. Hi everybody, I'm Annika. 100 people, that's awesome. Um, thanks Lori and Michael and everyone else for making this happen. Um, I'm going to just show a very few amount of slides to kind of show you what I do and hopefully not take too long because I want to hear from everyone else. So I'm going to try sharing my screen here. Um, and Okay, can you all see that? <clears throat> well, I can't see you, so hopefully. <laughs> Looks good. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is my farm. Um, I live in uh, north central Washington um, in the Methow Valley, the, the stolen lands of the Methow people. And um, I am on about one and a half arable acres um and it's so it's a pretty small operation we do have we did just start an isolation a half acre isolation at another plot which is exciting to have that more room and more isolations um so yeah i'm i started this farm in 2013 um growing contract exclusively wholesale contracts and then um last well two years ago some new farmers moved to the va to my little valley out in the twist river and we connected and they're also super excited about seed this is kaylin and kyle and the three of us have started a new venture called the methow valley seed collective and we're going to start retailing some of our own seed this year so that's um that's exciting and challenging and i'm looking forward to the sessions on how to keep track of your inventory <laughs> that are coming up um, so that's, uh, that's, that's the next thing on the docket. So for us, um, we're on a pretty small scale. We don't have a lot of big equipment. So one of the, you know, help big, big helpful things for, for seed, um, at this scale, I think is the community. A lot of times if we have something fun to do, like take seeds out of watermelons, we ask our friends to come join us and, um, and it, it's really helpful. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I want to just, for those of you who are be maybe beginners, there's kind of an important distinction, I think, for threshing and cleaning seeds. There's like wet seeds and there's dry seeds. And watermelon is a wet seed. And the process involves water and separating seeds in water. And that is, um, and then drying them. And then there's seeds that are dry seeded crops. And these are beet seeds, I believe. And beet seeds are an example of dry seeded. So another thing that real low tech solution for us is using the wind sometimes if there's a nice calm wind the column of wind is going to be like the most accurate winnowing then you can get much better from than from a simple fan so when when we get those opportunities and especially when we're first coming out of the field after first threshing stuff um the wind gets a lot of garbage out really fast so this is um this is when winnowing with the wind Another thing that I thought was a fun innovation this year was like rethinking dry and wet seeded. So these are peppers and I normally process them as a wet seeded crop. But this year I, um, they were sitting in the cellar for weeks and I was like, I'm not going to get to them. It's a, these are shishitas. They're a real thin skin variety. And I figured I'm just going to lay them out to dry and then we can stomp on them and turn them into a dry seeded crop. And that will give us more time before they rot. And that worked really well. So that was kind of a cool innovation this year. Um, hey, Michael, for some reason, I can't see myself or anybody. And I feel like I'm talking to nobody. Do you know how I can see people? I think that's the setup of the meeting that it's only recording the speaker. OK. All right, that's fine. We're here with you. OK. <laughs> um, OK, so that's that's that kind of dry seed, wet seed thing okay let's next uh oh no it's not letting me go okay there we go um so then the other really low tech solution to threshing uh seeds is um what we've mostly done we've started to branch out into mechanical threshing Sage, what are you doing we got import you know you got you got to get your labor force and um and the tarp it's very low tech and we use, we use sticks a lot 
I don't know if you can see the stick. Helps lift things, helps, you can whack things. These are the holy basil, it's easier to just um, stomp. Whacking doesn't do as much as stomping, but, um, and hey. this crop, particular <laughs> crop, we've converted to using a truck to thresh. Um, we used to use our feet, but now with the bigger quantities, we're able to do it better with a truck, but it has to be really dry um, to get that to work. Okay, so we just drive over it with the truck. This is another kind of low-tech machine that is a thresher. Um, this, again, I don't know how useful this is, but because this is a machine that a friend of mine bought, they, he ordered it from China to thresh wheat. He grows wheat just for his own use at home, and he lets me borrow it every fall. Um, it is, yeah, it's designed, I think, for rice. But it works really well for a limited number of things on our farm. This is, um, this is a friend, he's pouring um, radish pods in there. A lot of times we th also thresh radishes with a truck. So we lay them out on a tarp, drive the truck back and forth, back and forth over them. Unless the pods are extremely dry, I don't know how many of you are familiar with radish pods, but they're kind of foamy. And if they have any moisture in them, they don't pop open very well. And this machine doubled my yield. Um, by taking those ones after screening them out of the truck and taking the pods that didn't pop open and throwing them and drying them further and then throwing them in this machine, I got a lot more seed. I also use it, this is bachelor button. So this is the inside of the machine. You can see there's a drum that spins um, and the, the, the flowers just get whacked and whacked by that little drum that's spinning. And um, and then the, the seeds fall through and there's some air that also does some extra cleaning. There's a fan um, and then they pop out the other side. They still need more cleaning after that, but, um, but it's, a, it's really hard to thresh this particular crop. So that's helpful. Um, okay, so then moving on to some wet seeded threshing. This was a huge innovation for us this year. Um, we had trying to, at a hand scale, at the small scale we're at, trying to get eggplant seed out with by hand was extremely difficult and slow. And um, this right here is a, it's very similar to a roto hoe, which is a brand name. It's like a chipper shredder. Um, this one is attached onto a PTO to the tractor, which I really like because it's kind of less loud and stinky because the engine's farther away from where you're working. But um, I hope it's a little video. So this is, we're gonna, I'm throwing eggplant. I'd cut the tops off because there's no seed in the top. And then I throw the eggplant into the, into the top of the And it just kind of chips them and I gather them into the bin and then, um, I do kind of a similar wet seed process as I do with tomatoes and just add a bunch of water, the flesh floats, the seeds sink, and it's super quick. I did five times as much eggplant this year in about half the time with about half the people working. So it was a great innovation. Highly recommend that. I've also heard of people using um, the things that you use for making apple cider where you chip the apples up for pressing. That also works if you have one of those. Okay, the other thing that I think, um, you know, we'll, I'll talk about because we're on such a small scale is hand screens. It might seem obvious to the more experienced of you, but it actually, people at pretty, you know, middle scale, I learned from at Wild Garden Seed from Frank Morton, and, you know, he's growing wow, five to seven acres of seed, and he's still using a lot of hand screens. Um, and I think a couple things to mention is, um, you know, you can get hardware cloth at the hardware store. This is just window screen and it's super useful. Eighth inch, quarter inch, 16 inch hardware cloth is just very useful. And this has a deep side. So this is kind of like these hardware cloth screens I often use when I'm early in the cleaning process where there's a lot of garbage. And then this is like a pretty fine screen. This is a one one twenty second. I guess that means I'm not actually sure 122nd of what that means but mark will tell us um but anyway it's very tiny holes and we like to make our smaller screens with one edge open so that you can kind of pour seeds off rather than having to dump it's a little bit faster and just the, the ergonomics of hand screens really do make a difference making it the right width so that it balances on a bin that you're working in um so that when you 
go to pour new seed on it, you can balance it. And we really like having this one edge open and then also just having like the, the, the height of the sides comfortable in your hands. You can see all the different screens we have down here. Some of them are deep like these and some are just shallow and light so that you don't get fatigued in your shoulders. Um, the, these two screens go to a machine that is um, another machine that you can buy similar. And I think a couple other people are going to talk about machines that are similar to this, um, like the Clipper. Um, but this is one that is from the Hans Corporation, and it is an old machine that was like in someone's garage. And these screens just came to us, and we use these ones especially a lot for hand screening. But this year we upped our scale. Like with beets, we were doing like 100 pounds and carrots like 30 or 40 pounds, and we really needed um, a little mechanical help with screening. And so we, we unearthed this machine. It's from the Hans Corporation in the Midwest in Ohio, and it's, a, it's real old. It's a hand crank, but it really made a difference. This is cleaning carrot seed. Um, it tops the seed, and then it goes down into another screen, double screen to see and it also bottom so it does a lot of stuff the hopper and it runs with the top screen that gets the twigs off pretty well and so that's that's kind of as aside from the winnow wizard which mark will talk about which is like the holy grail of seed cleaning this has been a pretty cool technology for us but primarily we hand screen and win a wizard pretty much everything that we grow um and let's see how do i get i guess i stop share maybe to get back to you guys um yeah so that is pretty much all unless yeah and i guess we'll ask questions at the end is that right yeah, um, I did get, we did get a request in the chat about that first thresher that you said your neighbor has. Mm -hmm. and if you have any information about where that could be sourced or what the model name or number is, if you could throw that in the chat, we okay. will, the, the chat is being, will be um, captured. We'll, yeah, it'll be captured. So we'll be able to save and share that information. Okay. Um, and there was a question about what are you using for screening carrot and lettuce seed? If you have any real quick specific, like, mm. I love the eighth right. inch, or I love. I think I might defer to Mark on that because he has a really good like chart in the handbook for the Winnow Wizard that has specific um, numbers for like the length and width of the little holes that you need in the screens for lettuce. And um, is, is that okay, Mark? I don't, I do have like a lettuce screen. I bought one from Snake River Seed Collective called the Magic Lettuce Screen, which is a little bit smaller than the one I think that Mark recommends. And they're both useful because lettuce seed is not all equal. Yeah. As you probably know. It depends on the lot. Some lettuce seed is smaller, sometimes <laughs> it's bigger, depending on the season and everything. So having a couple different things that are similar but slightly different in dimension can really be amazing when you're working with stuff like lettuce and and, and lots of flowers are really difficult yeah. it's nice to have lots of variety of screen sizes and you can work up to that over time you can do a lot with a really few screens but then when you start getting into more quantities or then you it really is helpful to have more accurate screens so yeah and i just want to note i see some great questions in the chat and i'm going to save them for the end because i think they're um going to be really well suited for some general discussion and some so, of them will probably be answered by the other folks too yeah so thank you Annika that was awesome and I am now going to pass it off to Louisa Brower of Ferry Boat Seeds who is on uh San Juan Island in Friday Harbor thanks so, Laurie welcome Good morning, everyone. It's so exciting to be here. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to um, present to you guys. I know there's a lot of amazing seed experts in the room. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen just like Annika did. And I will assume that um, Laurie and Mike will bring me to a screeching halt if anything's going wrong. So I'll just plow ahead here unless I hear something. Okay, so just a few words to introduce 
me, what I do and what our scale is. Um, my business is called Ferryboat Seeds and we're located, just as Laurie said, on San Juan Island in Northwestern Washington State. Um, I moved to the island relatively recently, so Ferryboat Seas is only about five years old. Um, I moved here for graduate school. Um, I did a PhD in plant breeding at Washington State University, and I never found the exit door, so I'm still here. As you can probably hear, I come from the UK. Um, and I founded Ferryboat Seas out of a real passion for biodiversity and agricultural systems and um, and then also I just love um, thinking about seed quality in organic production systems um, and those are two things I can get my teeth into as a grower of organic seed. Uh, this was our wonderful crew at Ferryboat Seeds last year, um, Eric, myself and Shanley on the left and Rebecca Moore on the right. Um, so together the four of us grew about four acres worth of seed. Um, we have a business to business model where we're just doing contract production, kind of similar to how Annika started off. Um, I quake at the thought of doing retail, it sounds very complicated. So at the moment we're really just doing contract wholesale. Um, and we do quite a wide diversity of crops. Um, our largest are about one acre in size and our smallest are just a few hundred row feet. I can't actually very easily see what my bullet points say owing to all the Zoom stuff that's going on. So this might be slightly out of order with respect to what I'm saying. But um, yeah, we have one isolation at our own farm, which is about 17 acres in size um, and certified organic. And then I have one other isolation that I lease, which is also certified organic. And then um, we also do a little bit of subcontracting to other farms in San Juan County um, for non-organic production. That was our network in 2021. We had three subcontracting farms and our two in-house sites. Okay, so um, I am following Laurie's instructions to do a deep dive into two pieces of equipment that we love at Ferry Boat Seeds. The first is our pride and joy. This is the Almeco Plot Thresher. It's uh, The model is the LPR, if you're going to look at it on the Almeco website. Um, and yeah, it was a big investment and everything we spent on the Almeco, we didn't have left to spend on the second piece of equipment, which I'm going to show you today, which is why it's a bit more ragged than this one. But anyway, yeah, the Almeco, um, we bought new and um, it's been absolutely fantastic for us. So I'm going to use this photo to sort of tell you about how the seed flows through the machine and hopefully you can see my cursor on the screen. So the white tray at the top of the photo is where you feed the plants in. Um, so you feed plants into uh, this little flap and inside there is um, a cylinder that's spinning around and it's a raspbar type cylinder rather than um, a spike tooth cylinder. So it's just got these ridges on it and it rubs the seed heads against um, a concave, which is like a wire basket underneath the cylinder. And that's a really nice action to just sort of gently thresh the seeds out of the heads without causing too much breakage. The seed then um, falls down onto um, a screen, which is shaking as the machine goes and it travels along the screen. It's kind of shaken out towards the end of the machine. And um, over here, you'll be able to see from the other side in just a moment, but um, it falls, uh, down past an airstream onto this um, platform and it travels down the platform um, if it's good seed and comes out a little shoot on the other side of the machine that you can't see and you collect it in a small tote. So, and then all of your winnowings and chaff get blown out of the back end of the machine. Um, it works with a nine horsepower Honda gas engine. Um, and I think you don't have a pull start option. So it's always got an electric start, which is actually really nice. You would get tired of um, yanking that crank if you had to do it as much as you do at threshing time. Okay, so um, as you can see from this picture, you can actually stand on the ground to feed the machine. Um, it's stationary, so you can tow it behind your truck, and that works great for our business model because we're moving the thresher around to different farms, different locations. Um, however, it does mean that you know when you're threshing, you have to bring the plants to the machine, which is fine for small crops. Um, for large crops, it gets to be quite a bit of work. So um, for us, when we do a, 
um, one acre field of crops, what we're doing is swathing the plants onto long strips of um, row cover and we leave them to dry for a few days. And then you can drag them, you can drag a really long strip with loaded with a lot of plants um, across the field if you've been careful not to have too many um, like really spiky bits of stem left in the way because that can rip through the row cover and you lose a lot of seed that way. Um, but anyway, we drag, yeah, we drag the seed around and bring it to the machine and then um, feed it in. So the swathing for a one acre field takes us about two or three person days. And when I say person days, I mean the equivalent of one person working for one day. Um, and then to thresh a one acre field with this method probably takes another three person days <laughs> um, if it's going well. So that gives you a sense of um, how that works yeah and then for a one acre field as well you'd probably reposition the thresher a couple of times just to improve your access to different parts of the field and get the seed to it a bit easier so in this picture you can see us threshing some marigolds with the almeco um, and by the way this is the back end of the machine so here is where the seed is coming out um, and this also gives you an opportunity to see some of the adjustments you can adjust the speed at which the cylinder is spinning you can adjust um, the distance between the cylinder and the concave underneath so you can squeeze squeeze them closer together if you're threshing very very small seeds like lettuce and open that gap up if you're threshing something larger like beans um and then yeah so this is where the seed comes out um the speed of the cylinder will also change the speed at which this tray is shaking and then you can adjust the tilt of um this platform and over here you have um the opening of the wind outlet so you can adjust the wind speed as well so there's a lot that you can um, fiddle with and that makes the machine very versatile um, we've threshed marigolds with it beets and spinach which are our two biggest crops um, we've had good luck with lettuce calendula beans peas brassicas we've also done wheat and barley in there um, and that range of crops we were able to handle easily using three different sieves i'll make her make all different sieve sizes and two different concaves so that's the wire baskets under the cylinder they come with um, different sizes of gap between the wires um, so yeah i would say about this machine that it's been really reliable it's very easy to operate it's very easy to maintain it's never broken down um it does take a bit of fiddling with the settings if you want to get a good result um and i, I suspect there are machines that give you a better result but um i would trade the versatility for that sort of like precision i think um at least as far as our business model is concerned, that's what helps us the most. Um, one factor to consider is that in between seed lots, you need to clean it out, obviously, and that takes two person hours pretty solidly. Um, you need to take off the guards, you need to really, you know, take apart the machine, bring the cylinder out, bring the concave out. Um, and it just, yeah, it requires quite a few tools and is a bit fiddly, but it can be done. Yeah, so and then the tote where you collect your seed, as you can see, that's not a really large tote. So you're decanting quite frequently um, as you go. Um, next year, we will probably start collecting seed in super sacks on pallets to try and make our process that little bit more efficient for the larger crops. Um, but I am very interested to hear Beth talk later in the program about her Alice Chalmers all crop, because um, the more we work with a stationary thresher, the more it becomes obvious that it's a huge advantage to have a thresher that can move through the field, whether it's self-propelled or, or towed. Okay, so that's um, the end of my little story about the El Mako. Hey, um, I love that. I'm going to yes. jump in. Um, we had a question in the chat, and I'm also curious if you're comfortable talking about how much it cost and how much you paid for it and kind of a bit of the story, because I think it's a cool story, and how you decided or financed, decided it was worth that investment and financed it. Right. 
Yeah, well, I'm, um, <laughs> I find great security in planning and uh, sort of like the business planning and visioning um, and calculation side of things. So I made some quite detailed business plans at the beginning of my process. And that's how I decided that this would be a worthwhile investment to pay back over a few years. Um, I have a line of credit from my local bank. Um, which is what I used um, as capital. And then, uh, yeah, the purchase process, I guess I worked with Chris Etta at Almeco. Um, I had used, I think, some of their machinery as a student in, or, you know, in very, because I had a research job before becoming a student as well. Um, and so I thought of them as a quality brand and and that's why I felt good about going to them to make a big investment like this and um yeah we talked about the machine and I asked if he could find me a used model but they are uh, they don't come onto the market very frequently which I guess is a good sign I don't know um anyway I he gave me the price and uh I couldn't afford it. And we hung out and kind of would check in with each other every once in a while for about a year. And then um, he started to bring the price down. <laughs> I don't know if that's what you meant by the process, Laurie. Um, and I'm not sure if I should be recommending everyone to, to do what I did, but that's how it worked for me. And eventually the price came down to a point where I could afford it. I think we ended up forking out about 20,000 for the unit and the sieves. Um, so yeah it's not cheap um does that answer the question are there any other aspects that you want to yeah no that was great on earth okay um yeah so well this is the video which i won't um torture you guys with because i understand it doesn't actually run very well but now i don't know how i can okay um so the next item of um, machinery I'm going to talk about is our inclined draper separator. I just learned that's the proper way of referring to it. So we've just been calling it a draper um, in the past. But this is a tool that we use for separating um, seed of different surface textures or different shapes, or I should say particles, because you're trying to separate the seed from its contaminants. Um, and this is a picture that I borrowed from um, a manual on equipment for cleaning seeds. And I think that was a USDA publication. Uh, it's just a really nice diagram of how a draper separator works in principle. You've got your hopper feeding seed into the middle of a belt. The belt is traveling um, in this direction. And so um, it carries particles that are sort of rougher or flatter up the belt and they fall off at the top end and then particles that can either roll or slide down the belt um, will move in this direction and fall into a tote at the bottom. So you can do several types of um, separation this way. If you have a belt with a rougher surface, um, you know, you can separate flat or stick-like particles out of seed that is round and will roll down the canvas. Um, and if you have a smoother belt, supposedly you can separate um, seeds that will slide across it from lighter particles like um, sticks that will travel up the belt. So uh, an example of that first type of separation on a rough belt would be taking those little sticks out of beet seed, the, the seeds that are still attached to a piece of stem will travel up the belt and the seed will roll down um, or with a smoother belt you could separate those little pieces of peduncle out of carrot seed and the, the carrot seed itself will slide down the belt. Um, so that's kind of the principle. I don't know of um, anywhere that is making these new and selling them. Um, I would love to know if somebody has heard of um, an outfit that's doing that but for us uh, we modified a running treadmill to serve as a draper. Um, you'll have to forgive the appearance of it. It's pretty rough. We kind of mocked it up in a prototype form and then never had time to go back and 
shine it up. Um, you know how that goes. So uh, yeah, this is how it still looks today. I, I hope we'll get around to sort of fixing it up this year. But um, I will talk you through um, all the things we did to, to make it work. And it does work very, very well. I love it. Um, so the first thing you need to be able to adjust is the angle of the belt incline. Um, and so what we did here, there was an angle adjustment motor at the front end of the machine, um, which would sort of tip the belt up and down um, so that you can feel like you're jogging on a slope. <laughs> Um, yeah, the other great thing about uh, having a treadmill as your draper is that everyone who visits your shop will think you're really fit and active. Um, so anyway, yeah, so we remove the angle adjustment motor and then the belt actually tips down towards the front of the machine for storage. It just like pivots freely about a point at um, the front of the machine. So um, we just kind of stuck with that and we prop up a two by six or a two by four um, under the belt to, to um, tip it to the angle that we want for, for running. Um, sorry, I mean for running seed through. <laughs> I've never actually run on this treadmill. Um, yeah, so so that's pretty basic and then the other thing you need to adjust is the speed of belt travel um and we wondered if we could maybe just use the existing treadmill controls um but they did not give us the finesse of control at low speeds that we needed so um we bypassed all of the treadmill controls and wired in um, a small like controller unit that we've just sort of fastened up um, at, on the panel where the treadmill controls are and that allows us to um, control the variable speed motor um, at very low speeds and then um, another thing that you want to be able to do is meter seed onto the belt. And um, so I'm really sorry, Mark, but we're actually using our Winnow Wizard hopper at the moment. We built a little platform, as you can see at the top of the picture there, uh, to hold the Winnow Wizard hopper. Um, any type of hopper would do, um, but obviously it's help, helpful to have an agitator in it or perhaps to have a vibratory hopper. Um, so yeah, that's what we're using for that. And then um, the smoothness of the belt makes a big difference too. So I spent a lot of time sanding this belt down. It was too rough at the beginning. It was just clinging onto everything, including the seeds. Um, so yeah, just now it's been, well, it's been sanded for, I think probably a good couple of hours at least. And that got it down to a level of smoothness, which worked for beet seeds, which is what we mainly use it for. Um, the other thing we've done is elevate the machine on blocks so that we can fit a larger tote underneath it. And then we added these cardboard baffles and little strips of wood um, to channel. And then there's also like a um, sheet metal shoot under the um, belt that you can see a little piece of and that's all just to guide the seeds um, down into the collection tote at the bottom okay so then potential improvements we could yet make to this machine um, here is it here it is from a different angle um, it would be really nice to see if we could get a belt in a different material um, to use for different types of seed i suspect that it would work best um, to just get another treadmill and set it up with a different material rather than try and change the belt all the time um, i haven't tried that yet but it looks like it would be quite a big job and then other things we're planning to do is just improve this setup with the chute and the baffles um, and to secure the ramp attachment. And then as well, um, it would be nice to have some kind of dust collection system because um, dust from the beet seed does tend to sort of build up on the belt and um, it plugs the gaps and it just changes the way the belt performs as far as, um, you know, allowing the seed to move in whichever direction. Okay. I think that's it. Um, so I will gladly pass on to the next speaker. Thank you very much, unless there are questions. Awesome. Um, I'm sure there are lots of questions, but just in the interest of time, I'm going to pass it on to Mark. Uh, but I do want to note there are several people in the chat who found that really exciting. I, I too, when I learned about this um, a couple months ago from Louise, I was like, are you kidding me? That is brilliant. And this is what I love about one of the many things I love about seed cleaning is this just super creative innovation of um, 
machinery and, and things that aren't necessarily seed cleaning tools that can be modified and be incredibly useful. With that, I am going to pass it off to Mark Lutera of Lutera Enterprises. He is the designer and producer of the Winnow Wizard. He's going to talk about that as well as uh, another very uh, secret and cool uh, technique. No longer to be secret. All right. Well, um, good morning, afternoon, evening, night. I uh, have not done this on Zoom before. My name is Mark Lutera. I started with Wild Garden Seed in, in 2014. I never imagined when I was doing microbiology 10 years ago that I would be building seed cleaning machines. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Winnow Wizard, uh, sort of how it came to be. Uh, a little bit about what it does. And uh, then I'm going to talk about something else that we've been using at Wild Garden for a long time, but that has been uh, sort of kept under wraps. Um, all right. So when I came, when I started Wild Garden Seed, you know, I, we learned the threshing and the, the growing and the weeding, and then it came to seed cleaning season in, in October, November. And, and this was how we winnowed. And this is actually a brilliant way to winnow, to winnow behind a fan instead of in front because the airflow is smoother. And, and so Frankie came up with this. Uh, we had these little wind tunnel winnowing stations, but I was assigned to winnow 300 pounds of, of Persian press. And my wrist was getting so sore and I couldn't, um, uh, <laughs> I was, had a hard time being accurate enough. And I was like, there has to be a better way to do this. And so that first year I, I, I put together this, crazy thing. And I, I will say the cat in this picture has something to do with the fellow in the foreground in the previous picture. I don't know if he's in this session. Um, but this was supposed to be a two stage thing and catch the seed in between the two levels and that didn't work. Uh, but it did drop the seed down a single curtain. Um, we quickly unstacked the two layers. At, at first, people thought this was sort of strange. Like I thought it was cool. And they're like, this is sort of a waste of time. And I'm going to keep hand winnowing. Um, but, you know, I kept using it and other people were eventually convinced that, you know, this, this works. This is a little bit of an improvement over hand winnowing. Um, Hank on the crew uh, at the time was telling me, you know, basically I feel like I'm an arm now. I'm standing here just pouring seed against a plate. Um, and so could we have a hopper, you know, could we have a feed system? So the next year I added the hopper and and then we had sort of a wish list of improvements. Could we make the airflow stronger? Um, here I am watching quinoa winnow in the, the first prototype and apparently pretty pleased with how it's going. Um, but so we had a wish list, you know, could we have stronger airflow, uh, a better feed, you know, angle, adjustable angle on the feed tray, um, hopper agitator to keep things moving. And, and Hank, who's at Avoca Seed, is, is, I need to give him credit for inspiring a lot of these things because he would, he would jerry-rig something, like a drill with an auger bit to keep the things going in the hopper and then be like, uh, you know, Mark, can you improve this? Um, and so a lot of these, a lot of the ideas here started with him. Um, so I started, uh, started producing them and different seed companies wanted them. And so they've been at the last three seed conferences. Number two was at, in 2016 and in 18, I had number six went home with somebody. Uh, 2020, uh, number 31 went home with Annika. And if there were a conference this year, it uh, would be number 81 that would be there. Um, Victor, who works at Wild Garden Seed, does these little line, line drawings on on all of them. But the real secret to a winnow wizard is generating a maximally uniform flow of air. And there's even a little bit of, of magic to this in that it's not 100% replicable. The sort of differences in the micro perforations of the screens cause variations. And so whenever I build a new machine, I have to test the screen orientations to get it 
get it optimal, but there's five, four to five screens in sequence that break up the turbulence of the air and create a pressure differential. So you get a smooth laminar flow of air to separate by density. Um, and so here's one example of separating three fractions with lettuce seed, it was pretty clean seed on the left and a mix in the middle that could be re-winnowed and then the trash on the over on the right hand side. Uh, you sometimes the seed is lighter than what you want to get out. Uh, this is an example of, of beets that had beet sized dirt in it and we could blow the beet seed out of the dirt. Um, so the wild garden greenhouse looks a little different these days instead of the the wind tunnels with the box fans there are winnow wizards and sometimes we still manually winnow in front of the front of the wind this is victor um winnowing something while the wizard in the middle is running persian crest i think actually um the same seed that inspired it to get started uh here, here's one this was the first one that left the farm uh up to uh, nash huber's place back in 2016 and then i figured out how to build crates and they've been shipping out various places. All right, so I'm going to try to switch to a few little videos here. So hopefully I can talk over these videos. Can everyone hear? OK, um, so I've got a couple of little runs here. So this is a rough winnowing of spinach and so the hopper gate is open pretty wide it's feeding um this slot is also adjustable and that's open pretty wide and if you look at the spread you can see the the leafy material is is blowing way away and then there's these which are hollow seeds and sticks um and then the the good seed here so what comes out of this process is about 95 percent clean and then we'll do some screening on the the good seed here and then we'll run probably a fine winnow with the wizard again to get more of the hollow seed up because there's often a lot of hollow seed in spinach and so this next one is i don't know which brassica but it's an example of a fine winnow so the hopper gate the opening is smaller this slot is as narrow as i can make it and have the seed still pass uh, so it drops, you know, basically a very thin curtain of seed, and you can see this spread is very small, about you know, two inches by the time it gets to the bottom. So it's just shaving off things that are are slightly lighter than the seed, uh, which in this case turns out to be grass seeds and uh, damaged, small and damaged brassica seeds. We have a lot of seed weevil issues, and they often like will eat half of a seed and leave the remaining half. Um, so that is, uh, that's the winnowing part. There's a couple other things I've tried, um, that have nothing to do with wind, but just taking advantage of the hopper. Um, Frank came back from a big quinoa cleaning warehouse a few years ago. I talked about the machine they called the stoner that, uh, removes rocks and, uh, little bits of dirt with a magnetic field. And so I thought, well, what happens if I buy the strongest magnet I can buy and uh, see what I can do with it? And so this is a magnet with a pull force of 150 pounds. You know, if you stick it to metal, you'll almost never get it off. And it works variously depending on the magnetism of your soil. So this is some very magnetic soil. This is a batch of tepary beans that was combined too close to the ground. Um, and it's just deflecting the dirt particles. There's no wind blowing here. And so the, the dirt is being deflected off to the left and the, the seeds falling straight down. I'd say this, it probably moves about 90% and then you can, can run it again. Uh, hang on, I'm trying to pause this, but it's a uh, video is not working. So. Um, this file size is rather large. So this is, this is a prototype I have not, <laughs> Not, no one has really seen this yet, and it doesn't work as well as I would like, but it, it's an attempt to uh, use the wizard to separate kind of like a drape. It's another idea inspired by something that Hank has tried uh, with a ramp. And the idea is that the, uh, 
the round seed should roll down the ramp faster than the sticks or the things that aren't round. And so based on how fast it's going down the ramp, uh, it will either go past the divider or fall behind it. And as I've played with this, I think this is about 50% effective, but I really haven't spent that much time on it. And I think with a different texture to the surface and a, a few little tweaks, it could be quite effective. So uh, anyone who has a Winter Wizard, I encourage you to play around with ramps and, uh, and see if you can get something that really works well. Um, all right, back to this. Mark, while you're transitioning your videos, quick question. Can you ship these to Europe? I have shipped one partial kit to Europe. Um, the big problem is that Europe uses different power, 50 hertz, 230 volts. And I, uh, I can't, especially for the blower, I can't even really get a motor that I know will work. So if there were a lot of demand, I could, I could work on it. Otherwise, um, you know, I could send part of it and they'll have to figure out the blowers and things for their particular power standards. Um, all right. So at the Wild Garden Greenhouse, 95% of our seed cleaning uses uh, at this point either hand screens, we'll be hand screening or we'll be running things with the Winter Wizard, or we'll be using this little device. And a lot of you are probably surprised if you're familiar with Wild Garden Seed because Frank has sort of kept this as an informal secret for, for many years, but he gave me permission to share it today. And it really is quite useful if you're on a small scale, you know, even up to a hundred pound, a couple hundred pound lots. Um, a shop vac is a very useful tool for seed cleaning. Um, it is kind of like a belt thresher in a way. It, it generates abrasion, it accelerates the seed in a high velocity airflow, and then it rubs against the side of the tube and it hits the deflector inside. And that is good for knocking off, knocking like beet seeds off of sticks or knocking quinoa or even some grains out of their hulls and husks. Um, there are a few little modifications that are helpful. This is traction paper, the kind of stuff that you'd put on, or not paper, but the kind of traction stuff you'd put on a deck or on stairs. It's not the sandpaper kind, which actually damages seed, but more the rubberized kind. Putting that on the deflector and then also on the inside of the vacuum where the seed hits um, helps with the abrasion. The other thing, it helps to, to tie the tube in a knot. Um, it, it forces the, the seed to hit the side of the tube more often. And the other interesting thing is, you know, different shop vacs are going to be different. You want a big one, you know, at least five gallons if you're running a lot of seed. Um, but the smaller the tube, the faster the airflow, the more aggressive it is. And this is something that we've discovered. It, running through a small tube, my little anemometer that I have for the wizards, it, it says it's 130 miles an hour. And that's great for quinoa and grains and beets, but certain seeds, if we run sorrel through there, it often knocks off the seed coat of some of the seeds. And so it starts to damage the seed. The large tube is, is useful for things that don't fit through a small tube. Like one of the things we'll do is suck up whole, whole zinnia heads that are dry. And it'll, um, it'll knock off all the seeds. It'll break the flower petals off the ray seeds. And it also does a better job of not putting little bits of flower cone in there that you get if you stomp them. Uh, so it's easier to clean the seed. Uh, so we use, we use both the large, large tube and the small tube for, for various things. But yes, the shop vac is in very frequent use at, uh, at Wild Garden Seed. So, that's what I've got. And I will pass this along and take questions later. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. It was really fun to hear the story of how the, <clears throat> the Winnow Wizard came into the world. Um, I'm just going to acknowledge that we're at 10 o'clock. We have two more presenters who also have really awesome information to share with us. So 
I think we're probably not going to have a ton of discussion and Q&A time, so I'm going to remind you to please come to the Synergy space later today and we can have um, an out 45 minutes of just discussion and sharing. Um, we'll get in as much as we can now, but I think that this information sharing is just totally invaluable and really inspiring. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to David to tell us about the work he does with mobile seed trailers in BC, Canada. Okay, I really like the conversation, so I'm going to try to uh, fire through some of these slides. Um, so yeah, I work with farm folk, city folk up in British Columbia. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, everybody see that okay? Okay, so um, this was a, a mobile seed cleaner that um, was sort of, it was modeled actually after um, a seed cleaner that was done by the um, Whitby Island Farm School. And I think that was seen in 2017. We built it over the uh, course of around 2018, 19. Um, and we built it just to help farmers improve the quality of their seeds, um, to reduce the, the cost to them, and to engage in seed cleaning with uh, farmers around the province. Uh, we were lucky enough, so this pilot project drove around the province for a couple of years, it cleaned over 100,000 pounds of seeds of more than 50 different farmers and community groups. Um, and it was a combination of uh, purchased equipment and DIY equipment. Um, so I'll get to the things that are in it. This was our first iteration of the trailer. Um, and it was just it was something so farmers can drive uh pick it up take it to their farm use it and bring it back again um and our challenge right now is just uh how to have it shared with all the farmers wanting to use it which is a great problem to have uh this is what it looks like sort of set up at an event um there's a, a few i love all the diy equipment that's out there um I would caution people to make sure you, you get it built by somebody who actually cleans seeds. So this was designed by uh, UBC engineering students for us, really interesting design, but it needs a lot of tweaks to make it effective as a air separator. Um, it works quite well, but it's just to, to run it, you can't really see what's happening in this machine. So clear bucket would go a, lot way, a long way to help with that. Um, this is another uh, build your own air cleaner. Probably lots of us have seen it around the zigzag air separator. Uh, it works similarly to the next one I'll show you, which is um, my preferred model of an air cleaner. Um, it's fairly inexpensive to build. The expensive parts on the left hand side is a vibratory feeder, um, which on the right hand side, I modified an old answering machine. Um, a uh, motor, put it off center, and that's what I used as the vibrate, vibratory feeder. And then the Variac controls the speed of the vacuum. Um, I used the dimmer switch, uh, which just saves on cost. Uh, vacuum motors are electric, so dimmer switches I, so far don't seem to destroy the motor. This is the largest piece of equipment we have on the trailer. It's a Clipper 224. Um, the fellow on the right here, I think his, or, uh, group cleaned about 40,000 pounds of hemp seeds with it over the course of a few days. Uh, an auger would go a long way to make this more effective because you can see he was hauling buckets into the hopper above. Um, and, and that's how they cleaned 40,000 pounds. This is a small version of the clipper. So it works very similarly to the, uh, the machine that Annika showed with the, the two screens and it has some air separation in it. Um, it works exactly the same as the large clipper, um, but it just it works really well for small amounts of seeds. And of course, the winnow wizard. We don't. We've just heard about this. This is um, one of the challenges we found. We would take these things around to different farms, and people would show up to clean seeds, and they're like, "Yeah, I'm here to clean seeds." And they bring out their bag of beans on the stalks, and they don't realize you need to thresh the seeds first before you clean them. Um, so we, we were looking around for a thresher. There's, there didn't seem to be anything small scale in North America. We went to a company uh, called Sasago Uh So this is the Sasago TSR thresher from Japan. Um, 
and it's uh, it's pretty versatile. It has a couple different screen changes. You basically feed all your chaff, uh, the whole plant, into the top. Um, there's a lever on the top that you pull, and it opens the chute and blows out your uh, chaff. So it kind of keeps all the seeds in the drum, turning it until you pull that lever and shoot out the, the chaff. And this is just somebody using, this is a setup at a farm, um, just so with multiple pieces of equipment spread out. And um, this is a basic sort of price list of the trailer and what it cost us to put together. Um, and our challenge now is just to, to sort of think through the lifespan of shared equipment and how we share it into the future and make sure that in you know, 15, 20 years when repairs are gonna need to be done, we have the resources to do that without continued funding. Um, so we're just looking for ways to share that with farmers um, and have it be sort of a shared resource for everybody. Um, if we get into conversation later on, I can show some more details of the threshers and then um, one other thing I wanted to mention, just because threshing does seem to be uh, a challenge out there, I'm just going to switch to, if anybody's seen uh, the website called FarmHack, um, there's a great uh, bike-powered thresher that they, uh, they have up there. I haven't built it, but I'm just curious to know if anybody else has uh, worked on this design at all. Um, let me see. There's what the, uh, the design looks like. Um, I would probably attach a motor to it myself, um, but I'm just curious to know if anybody else has experience with other DIY threshing machines, um, because as we look to small scale stuff, uh, this one might come in handy. Um, so I think I'll just end there and then hopefully we can get to um, some more conversation later. Awesome, thank you. David, and now we're going to have Beth Razgershek from Canyon Bounty Farm. She's in Nampa, Idaho, and I am actually going to share my screen. <clears throat> and you're you're going to run it, right, Lori? Yes. Yep. Excellent. I'll pull it up right now, and we can do it together. Okay. Can you see that, Beth? It's perfect. Do you want me to give you a little hand cue? Yeah, I'll just okay. I'll just stay here with you and keep my Thank audio you. on and we can. Yeah, I will. There are a couple of videos that that might be able to play. And I apologize for not taking the sound off uh, ahead of time. So um, okay. just be warned, you might hear some loud motor motor noise. Um, if we can get the sound off, I'll try and narrate over. Okay. But um, well, hello to everyone. Hello to everyone, and I really appreciate what everybody has shared here. Oh my gosh, I'm so inspired and um, thrilled at what has been created. Um, I have been growing contract seeds for um, well over 20 years, and um, I have the fortune of coming from a seed farming family as well as um, being surrounded by seed farmers. And so um, I just feel like it's because of all these people that have supported me that, um, that you know, I've been able to stick around and do this for a while. Um, I grow everything from anything from aster seed to leeks on up to soybeans and garden and dry beans um, and so, you know, everything in between, a lot of wet seed and dry seed both. And um, uh, you know, I, I seem to have an affinity for the, for, especially for the alliums and the leeks. And, um, but I think my kind of what I want to push in this session with my experience is that how you um, collect the seed truly impacts how you clean the seed. And so if we can go to the next slide, Lori, um, I guess, I guess I could call myself a combine pusher. Um, and that's only because I'm in a region where I have access to combines and um, I have and you know, I just had people very patient and good teachers help me um, kind of lean into this technology or, or what it takes to use combines. Um, I will say as I get older and I don't and I, I no longer have employees. Um, I find myself using combines less and less, uh, mainly because you need a couple people a lot of times. And so I miss them. I truly miss them. 
Combines for me have always been the first step in seed cleaning. If you take the time for your settings and um, just tweak and play and tweak and play with all the different variations, you will come out with clean seed that maybe you'll only have a 10% clean out on, or even, you know, even if you have 20% clean out, that can save a lot of time when you're in the barn trying to clean seed, or at least that's, that's how I feel about it. Um, Lori asked me to lean into the all crop and I'll, I'll do a little bit around the all crop. Um, the, the finesse on the all crop is just a, a phenomenal. There's um, underneath that draper, which is the, um, um, the angled portion of the combine. Um, yes, thank you. That, um, you know, the, there's a belt, there's a big belt under there and you can, you can change um, that that belt that then changes the whole speed of the combine. And that to me is the real success of the all crop. Um, I mean, if you look at an all crop manual, it'll go anywhere from alfalfa up to, to beans and probably even fava beans if, if they knew about them when they were designing these combines. Um, um, the, the all crop definitely, I, um, I think most of you probably, would, if you've seen them before, You've probably seen them with, um, you know, a little bit different style than than this one. It's been modified to become a true plot thresher, so it's e it's either in the driveway or out in the field um, where I can throw seed on it. And um, let's, yeah, I mean, the finesse on this is phenomenal. It has truly changed my farm business, um, primarily because I was able to go to a lot more of the small seeded crops with it and come out with fairly fairly clean seed that then doesn't need a lot of attention when it's being uh, cleaned on the clippers in the barn. Um, and this is, a, it's sort of essentially a larger version of what Louisa shared earlier with the Almeca, right? I mean, different, different arrangement of things, but same idea. Right, same idea. Yeah, yeah, same thing with the concaves and the um, cylinders. Um, I, I, I think, you know, there's just so many, um, I, I'm just so grateful for how you can just fine tune it at every step of, of the process. And um, you can get them with motors, or this is a PTO one. And um, the rule at my farm is, if I catch you stepping over the PTO shaft, you're fired, you're gone, you never come back again, because, you know, um, I think Louise's um, thresher probably has a lot more OSHA uh, pieces of equipment on it. Uh, this was a, built in a time when that was not of a consideration. So it, safety is a huge concern for me around um, the all crop as well. But, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, it's just a great machine, um, um, you know, and um, like I said, it's really transformed my business. Okay, we can move on. Oops. Um, I'm gonna just talk about a couple other threshing units that I acquired uh, recently that I wish I would have bought 20 years ago when I first started. And this is a millet. I apologize, I spelled millet wrong. It's M-I-L-L-E-T-T, -T. it's two T's. Uh, they're made in Utah by the, um, I had to look this up. It's called AGE Manufacturing. I didn't buy it new. My neighbor had it sitting around and I was able to get it from him. And um, it's a very simple machine. And um, I have always thoroughly enjoyed growing pepper seed. And um, this thing just, you know, like I said, it, it just made me so happy when I finally realized um, what a great machine it was, but um, uses a lot of water and I have a ditch uh, in near my outbuildings. And so I can just run the wastewater down a ditch and that, that helps uh, kind of take care of, of the, of the water issue. And if we go to the next slide, um, Lori, I think we can play the video. Um, well, one quick question um, Annika had on the plot, on the, um, all crop. Do you just use it stationary or do you ever pull it? No, I pull it. I pull it out to the field. It, you know, it, it's, it's either or um, because it's, it's run on PTO. Um, I pull it with the tractor and just take it to where I need it. Um, 
it, you know, just, it just depends. Sometimes I have to bring crops in to dry down. And so they're under shelter. And, and then I just would use it um, in, in the driveway set up as, again, as a plot thresher. And do you just, do you hand feed it even when you're out in the field or do you pull it and like, you know, no, no, I disengaged all of that uh, so that there's the, you know, there's, it's just all hand fed. Yeah. Yeah. And you're not, you're not using it to cut the crops. You're just using it to thresh them. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Cool. Um, and Carl had to, a question about the modifications you did to the all crop. Um, do you have anything else specific you want to mention there, or that can also be a follow-up conversation and later in the synergy space or in the discussion? Yeah, I mean, other than just, you know, it has a sickle bar up front. It was, was supposed to have a reel. You know, I took all of that off and just made it into a, a plot thresher um, so that, you know, there, there is no sickle bar engaged. Um, oh, I don't, I, you know, um, let's see. I think, I think it was supposed, you know, like um, the seed hopper has a false floor in it and I just, collect the seed in the Rubbermaid totes. Um, otherwise, um, I, you know, I could have had an unloading. Looks like there's an, un, you know, it, I, I could spend so long, but the, yeah, there was an unloading auger associated um, with that hopper as well. But, um, you know, I'm only doing, uh, you know, gosh, like, you know, 60 to 80 pounds of leeks or onions. Um, I'm trying to think wheat, you know, can be maybe a couple thousand pounds, um, you know, if you want to run wheat through it. So not, not huge quantities, like you'd want to have an unloading auger for. So that's just some of the basic modifications. Thanks. All right, let's see. Okay, so I'll try and, if we can get the sound down, try and walk through this. So you just stockpile your fruit in that tray and you can shove it down into the, this uh, chute. It hits, a, it hits a shaft that has some fixed flails on it. And that's what grinds up the pepper and separates the seed from the pulp. And then using water in that chute and then also on the tray, the pulp and the seed are separated on the, uh, on the on the on that exit tray, what happens is the pulp stays on top of the tray, and then the seed goes to a lower tray, and then they exit at different points. And so you need to collect the um, you need to collect the pulp out one end, and then collect the uh, seed underneath. And I found that if I I um, I call it spatulizing, but if I if I just keep that spatula going, I can keep the pulp on the tray longer, and then I can. I can capture a lot more seed, and um, you do you do end up with some seed in your pulp, but it's it's not significant, especially if you spatulize and or figure out some other mechanism to keep that uh, pulp and seed on top of the tray longer, and you get a really um, you get a pr fairly clean um, you know seed seed um, container, and then you still have to do some decanting to get a little bit of the pulp out before you put it on seeds to dry down. Do you ever have to refeed the pulp or do you, does it do a good you know, you, I thought about that and you could, but um, you know, I'm doing hundreds and hundreds of pounds of pepper. And what I love about this is I, I, I was trying, going to try and focus on if it's a one, two person or a multi-person project. And this is easily a one person operation. And um, you know, um, I just have to, even though it's, it's uh, I hate waste. Um, I just had to make my peace with a little bit of seed going uh, into the, into the pulp and um, uh, just, just know that you'll, I mean, I don't know. It, it, it was never get it all. Yeah, exactly. You will never get it all, even though I think you should. So, all right. So that's the millet. Um, you can get them new, they're gas and electric, um, you know, just, I don't know. I, I looked at these over 20 years ago and I don't know what happened, but I just was never convinced it was worth it. And, and, and I wish somebody would have knocked my head against some wood and said, you should have done it. You know, you should do it. And um, yeah, well worth it. Yeah. Um, occasionally you can find them used as well. 
Did you buy it from your friend? Do you remember how much it costs? I don't have a sense of how much they cost new. I'm wondering if anyone else, Ooh, if anyone else yeah. does, they can throw it in the chat. You know, I, you're upwards of three to 5,000 easily. And I don't know what freight would include from Utah, but um, I, di I did an equipment, I did an equipment trade. So we didn't really put a cash value on it. So somebody just put in the chat 4,000. So yeah, yeah. All right. Do you know if it would work on eggplants? Is it strong enough? Yeah, to it's uh, millet, tomatoes, and eggplants are how they're strictly marketed. Do not expect to have a, you know, the website's a little bit minimal when you go to their, I think it's uh, A-G-E-M-F-G.com -E or something like that. Um, you know, it's a small shop and they're doing their best and, um, but it's, it's a great piece. All right, we can go to the cool. next. Okay. We can go on to the. Wait, is this the same one? Same one, same one. We'll go on to the belt thresher. <laughs> there we go. So um, I have a neighbor who, lo who lets me rent out his belt thresher. And again, I'm looking for one person operation, um, threshing options. Um, this is still a two person operation, unfortunately. But it, it, it is pretty simple. It's much more simple than a combine. You don't, the variables aren't as um, finessed as, a, as an all crop or a, or a plot thrasher would be, but it's, it's not bad. Um, I've used it for two seasons. Uh, obviously I've done marigolds and um, leeks and onions and beans. And um, so it can give you a wide range of options. Um, it's very easy to transport. I go down his long driveway and pull it home with my pickup. And then a lot of times I'll just keep it hooked up to a tractor to move around. I've only used it in, in, in my driveway. Um, you can see that I'm rather fond of tarps. I put all of my equipment um, over, you know, on top of tarps because I want to capture every seed possible. Um, that's just kind of my, my um, neuroses. But, um, I'll, if, let's see, the left-hand picture is a video, Lori. Okay. Um, well, I'm carrying that up. Quick, there are two questions about tomatoes in the millet and fermenting. Can you pour fermented tomatoes through the millet or would you use it more for chopping? I would use it for chopping. That's what it's, that's, that's its um, ace in the hole is the chopping and then being able to separate pulp. I've never, I, I, I don't put my tomatoes through it. I, I'm happy with how I do tomatoes. So I just strictly have used it for peppers. Um, Great. Uh, just... Okay, I'll see if I can do the same thing and turn the volume down on this one uh, as I play. <laughs> Okay, great. So we're running um, some um, marigolds through here, and um, so she's got a she's got a nice rate figured out. And these are two belts that are running at each at a different speed, and that's what creates the threshing motion. Is those different speed on the belts? Those series of bolts are how you would adjust the space between those belts. Um, you know, we were doing beans and then we dropped down to leeks. And so we had to change it. Um, you can see that it, it does separate those whole, that hole from the seed. And then um, the seed walks out um, onto the screen and the, the seed will drop through, the, the holes will pass over um, somewhat. And then um, what's great about the, the plot thrasher or this belt thrasher is that you have a fan. I disengaged the fan for the, vit, for the marigolds because we were blowing off too much. I couldn't get the fan speed slowed down enough. So we just um, disengaged that fan and, um, and you know, caught the seed. And um, yeah, it, it worked out good. I mean, Sometimes you don't know what's going to happen until you, until you engage with it and then tweak with it. But I think, you know, that's the success of using any of this equipment is just tweaking with it so that you can get it to run the way you think it should run and how you want it to run so that you get what you want at the end as well. So, so yeah, so that's the belt thresher. Um, it's, I know you can get these new. I know you can sometimes get them used. I have no idea what the cost is. I just rent it in the fall time from my neighbor. Um, so 
it's, I, if, if I wasn't so old, I would in, definitely invest in this if I was going to stick around in the seed world. Um, it's, it's definitely, it's just something else to have in your, in your tool pocket. So it's handy. Awesome. All right. And then let's go on to the, I don't know why it wants to keep replaying. Yeah. So, um, I just, I've always wanted to try this electric leaf mulcher. And so last fall on a whim, I just bought one for a couple hundred dollars and it's basically an inverted string trimmer or uh, I don't know what, what do people call string trimmers? Um, string trimmer. Weed whacker, maybe that's another, I don't know, probably depends on what region you're from, but it's, 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 it's basically a string trimmer head inverted. It's got two strings that come out and then it's just meant to chop up um, dried leaves uh, to um, make into a leaf mulch. And um, so I, I just bought it and thought I'd play around with it last fall. And I ran a box of leek through it, my uh, a box of leek umbles for the heck of it. It made a mess. It's very noisy. It's very, very aggressive. And it's incredibly dusty. Um, so eye protection, ear protection, and a mask. Highly recommended. Um, I germ tested the seed without even cleaning it and it germed just fine. Um, but again, this is a this is a kind of thing that you get a lot of, you get all your plant material with it. So um, you get you get chopped up stems, you get uh, you know everything with it. So it's just a way to release the seed from the um, the hull, essentially. Um, I haven't played around enough with it. Um, you can see that I just say use extreme caution because anytime you use anything new, you just need to be really careful that you're not damaging the seed. But for a couple hundred dollars, it's pretty easy. Uh, to see if it might work for you, but invest in a microscope so you can look at your seed and make sure yeah. you're not damaging it. And then you know alliums on the belt thresher as well. I'm sorry, alliums you on the belt. Alliums on the belt thresher. Yeah, yeah, it worked okay. You still get plenty of trash, but maybe not quite as much as like with this uh, leaf mulcher unit. Yep. So, so just something I wanted to share that um, I've always wanted to play around with and see see what it did. So can you use it on wet seeded crops or will it like no you it, it's it, it's meant for strictly for dry material. I mean really dry material. Yeah. So cool. uh, okay. you have to have a lot of that way you can make a lot of dust. And then um the last slide is I just think we should honor the work that we do and um how you know the the growing the growing techniques, our threshing techniques, our cleaning techniques. Um, they need to be shared and we just to kind of keep moving this forward. So this is a, just a silly little, simple little um, Mary Oliver quote that moves me through the day as I work. And um, so just thank you everybody for all your great work and for um, everyone here who has shared their um, techniques. Awesome. Thank you so much, Beth. And all of you. And now we do have time for some discussion and Q and A. Um, it looks like a lot of people have been sharing and answering each other in the chat, which is awesome. Um, I'm sure we're probably going to. I think we've caught most of it, but if there was something that you sure. put in the chat that was just burning for you, didn't get answered, put it back in. Yeah, Annika. And I want to say something too when you're done, but about what we just saw. Yeah, I just was going to ask Michael if you could give people the ability to unmute themselves so we can have a sort of in-person discussion. And Annika, go ahead and down at, the, actually, down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's the little actions. Uh, it's a little smiley face with kind of a plus, and you can use that to raise your hand, or you can just physically raise your hand. The great thing about using the icon is it will pop your photo up to the top so that I can see you and know that you're raising your hand. So if that's possible, please do that. If not, um, you can also put it in the chat. Annika, go. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you, Beth. And I love the Mary Oliver quote. Thanks for that. And I also, I just wanted to mention like for if anyone's more of a beginner or as you know, really small, like I am to not be intimidated by all those machines, because 
you really don't need them to do small scale seed farming. Um, and like, for instance, the marigolds, like that worked really well. That was fun to watch. And I just take a plant, turn it when it's really dry, turn it upside down, hit it with a stick twice and like almost all the seeds fall out. <laughs> and so, and if you're not doing like, you know, a quarter acre of it, if you're just doing a hundred bed feet, it works very well and you get a lot of seeds and you don't, you don't have to have big machines to do small scale seed growing, even contract seed growing. Cause there's so many small companies you can contract with. Yeah. yeah. Great point. And I also want to point out that, um, you know, resources like, like the seed cleaning trailers that David talked about and Beth reaching out to her neighbors uh, are also a great way to use use equipment um, and not have to buy it or purchase it. There are a couple of questions that just popped up in the chat. Beth, for you, with your pepper decanting process, do you have an idea of about what percentage of your seeds sink versus float? Ooh. I would say, oh my gosh. You know, I would say at least 85% sink. Um, and I used to save them, um, but I just, I just didn't like having the pulp in it and how it complicated seed cleaning. So I don't know if that's lazy or, um, you know, um, yeah. So at least 85% sink, if, if not more, um, it, it must not be a great percentage. Otherwise I would, um, I would be capturing it more if that was the case. I know we had, um, Annika, you mentioned radish, which is notoriously challenging to thresh because the pods are a little bit squishy. There is another comment about looking for a better means for threshing, tr threshing tough pods like okra. Um, I don't have any experience with okra. I'm, I would try a chipper shredder. Uh, I'm always... I, I also used to work for Frank Morton at Wild Garden Seed, and that's where I encountered the Rotoho Chipper Shredder. And it was dangerous, but brilliant. <laughs> I'm wondering if anyone has any other ideas. I just, I, I forgot to mention in, in my, about the Chipper Shredder, the dry seeded aspect of it. I only talked about the wet with the eggplant, but yeah, I think primarily what I've used it for is like sunflower family because the seeds get in are in a receptacle that's all tight packed and it just ugh, like echinacea or Mexican sunflower, chicories, things like that. Um, I, what was the radishes? I would worry that it might damage radish seed, but I don't know, I haven't tried it with radishes. Can I say something? Yeah, please. Um, we have a chipper shredder also, um, and we put an electric motor on it. Um, and I think it's, I don't know exactly the horsepower, but um, it, uh, uh, it might also check the blades on it. We got one that was like uh, modified. It doesn't have like the chipping, like blades, like a tiller. It has more like a, they kind of swing and, mm -hmm. um, there's actually some plans that you can find that somebody did for modifying a chipper shredder to do like small grains. And that's what this is. And yeah, it's pretty funny. They're like, they cut little pieces of garden hose and like put them over bolts and that's how it pads itself. So it's, mm -hmm. we use it for chicory and peppers and eggplants and um, yeah. And we've like have a bunch of little pieces of wood to like stick in certain places to like catch the make all the seed go in the right spot. Thanks, Hank. Um, also a question about uh, harvest and cleaning in wet and humid environments here in the Pacific Northwest where most of us are located. We have the joy of having a mostly dry fall and late summer and wondering if anyone on the any of the speakers or anyone else in the session would like to speak to how you handle doing some of this processing and, and threshing and drying down when it's not beautiful and dry and sunny out. And um, Michael, thank you for helping me keep up with the chat. I'm loving all the comments here, but uh, they're coming in fast and hot. Yeah. 
Uh, oh, I have to start my video here. I can speak. I'm in um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and yeah, that is a big problem. Like, you know, we cannot dry stuff sitting outside. <laughs> Do rain, <laughs> everything. So yeah, we have to cover stuff to to be able to dry to um, to dry it. And the other thing is, we find like it's best to put it in a dehumidified environment. That some stuff like if it doesn't get really dry, like you're just threshing and threshing and threshing and threshing, and still not getting like very much of the seed out. Which you know, obviously, the bigger the you know the amount of stuff you have, whether you have space to dry it in a controlled environment, is a big issue. Um, but we 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 like you know alternate what's going into the drying area and then get it out and clean it right we have to clean it right away because the humidity in the air literally it'll just absorb that humidity in a few hours and then you like can't thresh it very well so it is a big um a big issue i know a lot of people will dry in um like in, in our receipt company has done drying in like hoop houses and stuff like that but um you can i mean the rain can either come in the side if you get a big a big thunderstorm <laughs> It's definitely an issue, but it can be something, you know, you can, uh, you can figure it out. Yeah. Thanks, Erica. Anyone else want to chime in with? I think Fox I don't, I live in a dry climate, but so I'm lucky in that way. It still gets wet in the fall sometimes, but um, I think my best investment up front was uh, a high tunnel a pretty big one because for that very purpose, just to have somewhere to drag stuff in so that it's not getting rained on. Um, mm -hmm. And you can get grants. I don't know if they still give those equipped grants, but um, you can do it pretty inexpensively if you, the USDA gives out grants for those high tunnels and they're in, yeah. And it also just does a place to clean seed in, in the fall if that stays fairly warm. If there's any sun, you can, I, I you know, it can be, zero degrees out and snowing. And if there's a little sun, it's warm in there to keep cleaning seed in December, so. And I would advocate for fans. You know, or things in a greenhouse, laying them out on fabric. We use a lot of what's called geotextile fabric, which is a breathable sort of poly spun um, fabric that we use for drying down um, that works great. And I don't know, Mark, if you wanna to speak to it all. I know Mark has some plans and has done some innovation around using um, hot water for drying. And then also there was a question in the chat if anybody wants to speak to threshing zucchini. But Mark, I'm gonna see if you have any thoughts first. Um, yeah, I've built a couple of hygronic dryers that uh, uh, use hot water to heat air up to about 85 degrees, reduce the humidity. The one in our greenhouse actually uses the same system that heats the benches in the spring. Um, so it's a hot bench and then the tables stack inside an enclosed chamber with some fans. Um, and then the hot water holds it at 85 degrees for drying. So, you know, that's if you have a hot bench system uh, in your greenhouse, then that can potentially be low cost repurposed for seed drying. Thank you. And also just want to point out in the chat, Jared just shared a link to uh, that granting program that Annika was mentioning that can fund high tunnels. So I'm just gonna see if I missed anything else in here. Um, and Hank also mentioned the shop back is great for sucking out zucchini seeds. So if you chop them up and then just suck them out with the shop back, David's also giving a nod that maybe you've done that as well. I haven't, but what a great idea. Yeah. Um, I'll also mention about the drying. Yeah, we use a dehumidifier room in our climate. You just you just can't. I sometimes kick myself because I miss cleaning those brassica seeds when it actually is dry out in August. So just get to the seeds when they're dry. Um, but sort of as we've been talking to farmers about using the equipment we're sharing, one of the things that constantly comes up um, and you've seen as as we all talk about the equipment we use is um, the equipment itself isn't going to clean your seeds. You need to have some practice and skill using that. And that starts with actually assessing the seeds in your hand before you put it into any machine and knowing if they're ready for the machine. So it's, uh, we, we all know it's fairly nuanced. Um, 
and uh, yeah, just like an instrument, it's it doesn't play itself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I would also plug again that the idea of things that aren't necessarily built or meant for seed in our greenhouse here at the Washington OSA Research Farm, we got a it's like a drying cabinet from our local hospital that they were getting rid of. And it's fairly small, so it's not, doesn't do a large scale of things, but we've used it for just drying, giving extra drying time for carrots in the fall, putting trays of carrot umbels in. We've used it for dry corn to get the dry corn dried down and finished so we could um, take the kernels off and thresh it. So just sort of being aware, like sort of industrial uh, opportunities for equipment that could be repurposed is another thing to kind of have have in mind and have in your your toolbox. Yeah, Carl, we, I've heard this. Okay. Oh. Hank, go ahead. But then I'm I'm gonna ask Carl if you wanna if you can if you wanna come off mute and share. You shared several cool things in the chat. Um, so maybe after Hank, if you're willing to to come on and do some sharing, that'd be awesome, Carl. Hank. Yeah, we have a um, one of a hydronic dryer, um, kind of like what Mark was talking about, and it's uh, like it dry having your seeds dry is super important. And what, what I like about the dryer is it's like it's mouse proof and it has a whole bunch of shelves in there. You can just put your stuff in there and leave it in there as long as it takes, and you don't have to worry about it like getting too hot or my seeding it or whatever and um that's really nice thanks hank carl you up for it sure um i just shared on uh the chat uh, a file i found a couple years ago the seed uh, moisture content calculator and um i didn't real really realize that i wasn't getting my seed quite dry enough you know you think it's dry but it's not dry uh, especially with contract growing, they're asking for 8% on your seed, which is is quite dry. So what we do, um, I just have a Tupperware container, fill it two thirds full, get a um, just a hygrometer that has a temperature plus um, um, uh, air moisture calculation. Yeah, something like that. Yep. And you just put it in the little, uh, in your Tupperware, close the lid, let it sit for 30 minutes. And then you can input into that Excel file um, your temperature in Celsius as well as your um, relative humidity, and it'll calculate to your seed moisture content and give you the target ranges. Um, it's a great tool. It has a broad range of um, uh, seed that you can choose from. It doesn't have everything, but it has a great range. and. Um, and then we built a, I think as others have said, we just built a, a chamber in our barn on a concrete floor, um, built racks. Uh, it allows us to actually get to our, bra- like our brassicas. We can get to them when they're not, to- when they shatter, but they're not totally dry. And then we just rack them right away, get things drying in, in August um, with some fans going inside of there. Plus it's mouse proof. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah. it really helped our quality. That's not something we've really spoken to, but I'm sure everyone has encountered is being able to keep things rodent proof, um, you know, rodent proof and bird proof because seeds are delicious and nutritious and uh, they're good for our creature friends too. So having, finding ways to do what we need to do and keep seeds um, protected is also a big part of threshing and cleaning. And I am actually, unfortunately, going to stop us, even though I know we could do a lot more sharing and have a lot more questions and um, great experiences. I want to say a huge thank you to our five presenters today for sharing your expertise and your experiences. Um, A big thank you for all of you for showing up today and being here with us and participating. It is my great hope that you were inspired by something today and you carry it forward into the rest of your CD lives. And I look forward to continuing the conversation in the comments. Uh, If you can show up at the Synergy Space today at four, I would love to see you there. 
And thank you, Michael, for being our technical assistant today and, and helping us run everything smoothly. Um, I look forward to seeing you all around at the rest of the conference for the week. And um, if everybody wants to come off or if you want to unmute or, or make some fun, happy, excited sounds and, and body language to say thank you and hello and woo, see clean